perhaps the best known eight notes in all symphonic music, the opening bars of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. That was from the 1974 Deutsche Grammophon recording with Carlos Kleiber conducting the Vienna Philharmonic, a recording that became an instant classic and has remained a prime recommendation ever since. But in the hands of someone else, here Leopold Stokowski in 1940, it can sound very different indeed. And the difference between varying approaches to the same piece of music is the subject of this new series. I'm James Jolly and I'm joined by Rob Cowan to explore the idea of interpretation in classical music and what Carlos Kleiber says about this most famous of all pieces of music that Stokowski doesn't and vice versa. Those are certainly not going to be confining ourselves to those conductors. We'll be bringing in a host of others along the way and we'll end by recommending a modern version that we both enjoy. Modern because music is a living thing and if you're inspired by the music making you hear we'd like to think that you could go out and actually hear those musicians play this music, of course, when live music returns. Each podcast in this series has an accompanying playlist on Apple Music and our recommended album is available in Apple Digital Master Sound. Apple Digital Masters are your guarantee of the best listening experience as you stream on Apple Music, ensuring studio quality sound without affecting your battery or bandwidth. Gramophone's website will also feature reviews of many of the versions we discuss along the way. And again, all are linked to Apple Music. Rob, you've been listening to music for many, many years. I've been listening to music a little bit shorter time, but not, not too much. Um, and I think we both probably very early on became fascinated that if you play one recording of Beethoven 5 and then another, they could potentially be completely different experiences. Would you, would you agree? Yes. The first LP that I ever bought of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony when I was about 14 years old was on a gala LP, which seemed to be pressed on tin. They were the most terrible recording uh, recordings and they used to distort and everything, but still uh, was by the Sonor Symphony Orchestra conducted by Hans Ledermann. Well, I've uh, looked on the internet and they do actually exist. This recording came out on a number of labels. And I was at a great advantage with Beethoven 5 because I had never heard that opening four-note motive, ever, in any context. Not for V for victory, not for fate knocking on the door, nothing. And it had a tremendous impact on me. I can't remember that performance now, I must be honest, because within a very short while I was listening to other recordings of it. I think the first performance does have an impact, but the degree of that impact will depend on how great the performance is. Soon afterwards, I got hold of the 78s of Toscanini, recorded in 1939 with the NBC Symphony Orchestra, and that blew um, poor Hans Lederman right out the window. It was so impactful, and uh, I played it and played it and played it and played it, and then got it on LP and got it on CD, etc., etc. But I can just tell you a little story, not about Beethoven V, but about Tchaikovsky V. I used to have the 78s with Stokowski and the Philadelphia Orchestra, orchestra and I loved the work I loved the music I wasn't aware that the performance was anything special I just adored what I was hearing and I came to the stage I must have been about 14 at the time I saved up my pocket money and I thought well I'll get an LP so I don't have to uh, turn over the 78 sides all the time and really enjoy the piece as a whole so I went and got a concert classics an HMV LP by the Northwest German Radio Symphony Orchestra I think it was under Wilhelm Schuchter. So I got it back, I played it, I think I played it once. And then I went back to my Stokowski 78s. And that was the power of Stokowski's magic in that music. Funnily enough, many, many, many years later, 
a broadcast came out with Stokowski conducting that very orchestra of the Northwest German Radio Symphony. And of course, had that been the performance I replaced the Philadelphia recording with, I suppose then the effect would have been very different. But I think first encounters are very important, but their impact depends on just how good the performances are. My first, which was purely because my parents had um, had a recording, was Karl Schuricht. I don't really know much, like you, I don't really remember too much about the very first performance, but I remember some years later, and I had the great advantage that when I was at school, my, uh, my tutor was Richard Osborne, of course, of, of Gramophone and Radio 3 fame. And I remember he did a, a building a library of the complete Beethoven symphonies. And I remember he came down in favour of the Karl Böhm set, also with the Vienna Philharmonic. So I think that was probably my, my first real encounter with the with the work and I remember I mean I think it would be impossible almost to encounter Beethoven 5 and not be bowled over because it is just one of the most extraordinary openings in all music and of course you know, not just an opening it just it carries on um, in that sort of extraordinary intensity that you know in a great performance just you know picks you up and doesn't put you down for about 35 minutes. Well the interesting thing about Beethoven 5 you know if you don't know anything about musical form you don't have to learn it from anything other than Beethoven 5. Let's think about it a minute. You have the first movement, sets its cards on the table, argues the toss and the middle in the development section, then the, the opening ideas come back, transform because of what had happened in the middle of the movement, there's a processional, there's a noble scherzo, there's a blazing finale and there's a sense of closure at the end of the symphony. And I think that's the most wonderful thing about it. You come to the end of Beethoven 5, and the world seems a better place. And, you know, I've been listening to this symphony for over 60 years, and it always has that effect. I never get sick of it. Whenever a CD comes through the post that is a Beethoven 5, I never think, oh, a Beethoven 5 again. Never, ever does that occur to me. I always want to listen to it again. Sometimes if it seems like a dull performance, then I think, well, I've dutifully got to sit through this until the end. But the music as you say, absolutely magnificent. One of my two favourite symphonies, the other is the Jupiter of Mozart. Absolute yeah. feel-good symphonies that uh, have no equal. I think, you know, we've both been reading Gramophone for many, many years, and I remember I was I just started reading Gramophone when the Carlos Kleiber recording came out with the Vienna Philharmonic. And, of course, at the time, I mean, nobody really knew who Carlos Kleiber was. He hadn't made any records before. I mean, this was his kind of blazing entry into the catalogue. And I was I was sort of reflecting the other day that it's it's the sort of nature of of record collectors and people who are interested in records, and and I think it's something that you can actually take into other you know other disciplines. So for example, you know car magazines have an enormous following. I mean, vast number of people buy car magazines, but actually, if you think about it, I mean, we don't pop out and buy a new car every month or even every year. You know, it's many years. But there's this sort of fascination with you know being on top of the field as it were knowing what's out there absorbing what the critics say so that if somebody came to you and said look I'm, I'm 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 thinking of changing my car you know i'd like to buy something you know for a sort of family of five and it's got to do this and it's got to do that your car buff will say well of course you know what you really need is you know this model without ever having probably seen the thing, certainly not having sat inside it and never driven it. And I feel that sort of with, with, with record collectors, we have that same, same kind of hunger that, yes, we know the field. And if you said to your average gramophone reader, Beethoven 5, I think you'd find an enormous number of them would come back and say, well, of course, the Carlos Kleiber is a classic. And of those people who say, well, the Carlos Kleiber recording is a classic, I suspect there would probably be quite a... A reasonable number who've never actually heard it but it's just sort of it's there as part of legend this is this great recording and then of course when you do encounter it and you realize that you know the critics were spot on you know his, there's this extraordinary performance but I mean my point is that there are there are not very many of these kind of and I hate the word iconic but it is an icon in the recording catalogue that somehow is so sort of stands out so huge 
from everything around it that it almost kind of blocks the light from other performers. You know, oh, Carlos Clavi, you've got to hear that. And it actually makes it quite diff difficult for when other versions come along, uh, you know, when they're being sort of compared with it. And of course, you know, the meat and drink of gramophone is, is comparison. I mean, when you, when a, a new recording of Beethoven 5, you know, drops into your inbox these days, probably I would have said on your letterbox, but these days we're kind of in a, a digital domain. I mean, what do you feel you have to convey when you write a review of this new recording of Beethoven 5? I think I feel I must convey just how great this music is, that it doesn't matter how many times you revisit it, under how many maestros... Uh, how many recordings from what era? Don't forget, we've uh, we've been listening to Beethoven fives on record now for over a century, starting with Arthur Nikisch. Funnily, the other day I was looking at the gramophone for October 1925, and there was a um, a review of four different recordings, including Arthur Nikisch, and they were similar to the reviews you might get today. But what do I feel a performance should convey? Um, I think the great thing about the Carlos Kleiber is the fact that it is without eccentricities. It is absolutely direct. And I think the best Beethoven fives probably don't court little tweakings, little dynamic alterations, little uh, crescendos and decrescendos added too much flexibility in terms of tempi, uh, tempo alteration. And, and Kleiber, like his father, Eric, whose performance uh, with the recording, Decker recording with the Concertgebouw Orchestra, was quite similar to his, he gives it to you. He fires straight from the hip. It is a totally honest performance, uh, artistic and musical uh, integrity, brilliantly played, brilliantly recorded, there's nothing you could question about it. And I think that's what's given it its appeal. You listen to it, you come to the end of it, and say, well, that was Beethoven 5. I can't go back and say, well, I wish he'd done this or that another way, because there is nothing to question about it. Now, there aren't many performances of Beethoven symphonies that have quite that degree of, let's say, integrity. You know, he had integrity by the bucket load, Carlos Kleiber, and both the seventh and the fifth of Beethoven were among his greatest symphonic recordings. I think probably the fifth was the fifth for an era. Now, when I mean, you know, this this Beethoven five that you know arrives in your in your listening room. Obviously, you know, the sort of tools that you've got as a critic, you've got the score, so you know you can check that the that the conductor doesn't go sort of wildly, as it were, off piste and do sort of things that, that aren't in the score. But do you as a critic have to have a kind of ideal in your mind for when you're reviewing Beethoven 5? I mean, in a way, do you almost need a narrative to say, you know, as far as me, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Beethoven 5 is, is, is about this. And to make it a great performance, it has to do this and it has to do this, and it has to do that. I mean, what do you need a kind of blueprint or a, perhaps an ideal Beethoven five, as it were, as a sort of, you know, to, to match it against? That's a very interesting question. And I suppose I could initially answer by saying that if I've got a really, really strong idea, personal idea, as to what Beethoven 5 should sound like. I shouldn't be writing about it. I should be conducting it. And I think that uh, that is the thing about great artistry. But somebody like Toscanini or Furtwängler, for example, they had a committed view as to how very, very different, uh, the two different uh, uh, interpreters, as to how the music should go. I try not to start off with a sort of blueprint because that way you limit yourself. What I would say is that I think any reviewer, any critic should have immense experience in listening to versions of whatever symphony he or she is reviewing. Beethoven 5, you know, as I say, goes right back to Arthur Nikisch. There's even a, a recording from 1910 before Nikisch coming right up to date uh, with Manfred Honig and, and, uh, and, and Maris Janssens and, and other people. And 
I think you need a lot of experience. You need at least to have heard 40 or 50 versions from the last 20 years in order to put your thoughts in context, not because you want to be influenced by what you've heard, because, but because what you've heard tells you what's possible. That's the amazing thing about listening to these various conductors. They give you alternative views and by treating you to their various uh, interpretations, you learn what's possible with the music and that expands your mind, expands how you feel about the potential of the piece, how the score can be interpreted. After all, look, you mentioned the score. Of course, I do use a score like most other critics, but you hear a hundred versions of Beethoven 5. They all sound quite unlike, and yet they're all using the same score. Even if you're talking about the Baron Reiter or text edition edited by Jonathan Del Mar, it's still basically the same notes. I mean, there are differences in, in indications, but it's the same score and as, as interpreted through different ears, different uh, minds, different emotions. And I think you've got to mark the difference between being a critic and therefore keeping an eye on what should happen and being a listener and keeping an ear on what you feel. And there's a big difference. The critic is not the same as the subjective listener. You've got to separate the two. And uh, so I try to do that where I can. I used to do a lot of concert reviewing. Uh, obviously, that's very different. You go into a concert and you don't think of other interpretations. You have the orchestra in front of you when we're lucky enough to have an orchestra in front of us. And, you know, you start from scratch. With records, you can't do that. With recordings, you can't do that. Because even with streaming, people have to make comparisons. Now, the difference between the situation now and the situation 40 years ago, when it was all uh, records, is that now, of course, you can sample performances. You can dedicate uh, half an hour to listening to a Beethoven 5 by listening to it on Apple Music or whatever streaming system you happen to have. You're not so much investing money as investing time. But in each case, you are investing time. Let's look at it this way. A lot of people who are watching us, listening to us, will have massive collections of maybe hundreds, thousands of, of CDs and LPs. And there will be LPs and CDs in their collection that they've only listened to once and will only listen to on one occasion. So really, if you look at it that way, then... Uh, listening uh, a streaming listen, listening to a streamed um, experience only once is nothing really terribly unusual it's no, the same sort of thing no it's i mean in, in in a way it's actually it's a fantastic era to live through because you know instead of having to shell out for your you know your copy which you will only play once you know, you can you can dip in, and and in the course of this conversation, we're going to you know dip into a, a number of performances. Um, I just want to go back to sort of you know we were talking about different approaches for the for conductors of a, of a work like Beethoven Five. I mean, in simple terms, I mean, should we can we just sort of take apart the various tools or things that a conductor can do, as it were, to impose if that's not too sort of dramatic a word their view of this work on the music and I guess the first one is you know tempo I mean you know at the top of this podcast you know we heard the opening of Beethoven 5 play conducted by Carlos Kleiber and we heard it conducted by Leopold Stokowski I mean two markedly different approaches I mean one was considerably slower and in Stokowski's case you know very, very kind of almost sort of fist thumping on the table. I mean, you know, tempo is, you know, for somebody who knows nothing about music, I mean, that is the thing that will make the most immediate impact. Wow, that was fast or wow, that was slow. I mean, that's, I think that's a, a fair point. Would you agree? I think it definitely is. But I think you've got a complication with the opening of Beethoven 5 because a lot of conductors and Stokowski is one and Manfred Honeck is another take those opening four hammer blows at a different tempo to the Allegro that comes afterwards. So there's a contrast in tempo right from the off. Yes, tempo is important. You get somebody like Furtwängler who studied Schenkerian analysis, which very briefly uh, deals with harmonic architecture 
nature, follows the music where it's going harmonically and the tempi are dictated largely by that uh, journey. That's very important, and, it, and, and but always sounds entirely natural. I think in, uh, tempo is important, but silences are important as well. You know, you get to the transition between the third movement and the finale, um, and after, once you get into the finale, rests, pauses of all different sorts, they all to sound part of the music. And in great performances like uh, Carlos Kleiber, like Fortevanda, Toscanini, etc., they do sound like part of the music. So there are all sorts of different, uh, mostly to do with dynamics. Yes, I think tempo is important, but if you hear a really exciting performance that isn't fast, it will have more of an impact than a performance that isn't particularly exciting, but is fast. We've got we've got one comparison coming up, which is very interesting. I won't mention it now, but um, a, a, between a deliberate tempo, which is really grips you by the throat, and one that's less deliberate, which for me flies past a little bit too much. So I think tempo is important, um, expressive styles if you go you know the difference between orchestral performances pre-war and orchestral performances post-war the main difference is with the strings where there was expressive slides portamenti uh, which had a certain effect they take a bit of uh, time to get used to but you do get used to them and funnily enough a lot of conductors are bringing them back in modern performances uh, so it's seen, because it's the way singers sing, as being um, a uh, reliable way of, of expressing a musical line to give a, a little slide here and there to underline the, the way the music is going. And there are other aspects of it, you say dynamics are very important, um, and delicacy. You know, I think we're going to hear one performance which I, uh, later on, which I, I found ex uh, particularly delicate in, in the way the, uh, the music is handled, the slow movement of the, of the symphony. But there are all sorts of things, and a lot of them won't actually occur to you until you actually hear the performance. You think, oh, I didn't notice that before in the bassoons, or I didn't notice that before in the clarinets or flutes or in the strings or that accompanying figure. And you talk about a score, there's one disadvantage with the score, and that is you can, if you're following a score, hear what you see. So something yeah. may not have occurred to you, say a, a bassoon backing violas or something, and, and, you, and you wouldn't actually notice it unless you were watching the score. So oh, it was interesting, that, pack, that passage where the bassoons back the violas. But actually, nobody would have noticed it unless you'd pointed it out because you were following it with a score. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. Obviously, you should. But, but in my view, you should have a score by you. Uh, not necessarily following it um, from beginning to end when you listen to the performance. But if you know the work well, if you don't know the work well, then you should follow it from beginning to end. But if you know the work well, have it by and think, I wasn't quite sure about that passage. Let me go and have a look and see what's written. Is that absolutely right? There's a very good example in Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. I had a, a, a little set too with a, an extremely a, a good conductor about this. Um, after I'd done a building a library on uh, uh, for the BBC of Beethoven's Fourth Symphony, and uh, in the first movement, um, the central section, uh, I've always felt that it should keep to the same tempo as the outer section, the Allegro Vivace, and it's thrilling if you do that. And um, I heard, I think Rudolf Barschau, somebody conducted, and that's exactly what he did. And I, I thought it was marvellous. And I said on the programme that it followed what Beethoven wrote in the score. And this conductor said, oh, typical, you know, it's in the score, so it's got to be right. I said, no, it's not that it's got to be right because it's in the score. It's because the score actually reflected what I felt was right in, in, in the interpretation of the music. It was that way around. So I think the score is most valuable when it reflects your own instincts about, your, about the music. And I think your own instincts at the end of the day are probably more important. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's sort of where the gap 
Interesting, that's where the gap between the critic and the kind of informed listener closes, because I don't count myself as a record critic, but I think I've got pretty good taste and judgment that if I go to a performance, you know, I know a good performance, I know an outstanding performance, I know a kind of duff performance, and, you know, I'd probably be hard-pressed to give you the details, but I could give you my response and say, actually, I thought that was extraordinary, and, and probably pick out some some details. But, I, I mean, it's good to hear that, you know, actually... At the end of the day for the critic, there is that sort of that instinct that you draw on over and above the score. I mean, just going back to what you were saying about things like inner voices coming out. And if you've got the score, you know, you can be mis mis misled, as it were. Of course, if you're if you're sitting in the festival hall and there's a performance of Beethoven 5 going on, and then all of a sudden you see the bassoon, you know, sort of being picked up from the floor. In a way, your eye is almost certainly going to go. So that's sort of equivalent to suddenly seeing, oh, the bassoon line is now appearing in the score. You know, you will you will visually be kind of, you know, your eyes will lead your ears, I suspect, a little bit in, in concert. Yeah, that's true. And also watching DVDs. And I don't like watching music DVDs. I remember Sviatoslav Richter on a Bruno Monsignor uh, uh, DVD about his life. It was marvellous. Um, and he talked about DVDs, watching people on DVDs. He said, what do you want to watch people work for? You know, that was his attitude <laughs> to it. And I, when I listen to DVDs, I mean, obviously, if I'm reviewing a DVD, I will sit and watch the DVD. But if I'm listening to it for pleasure, I will put the DVD on this computer and I will take my um, Bluetooth headphones next door and listen to the performance without having to watch it. Well, we've both uh, brought a few uh, recordings of Beethoven 5 along for this, this conversation. I mean, you've tended generally to go slightly sort of earlier than me. I've sort of tried to keep them reasonably within my, my own uh, sort of era, my own listening era, which I guess sort of started mid, mid-70s. Um, you're, you're, you've got the first excerpt and you've, uh, you've chosen um, Hermann Skärchen with the, uh, the RPO. This is a, a recording from the 50s. I mean, what's special for you about this? Well, Scherchen was one of the first people to attempt to reflect Beethoven's metronome markings. But the beauty of his performance is, unlike some later people who have done the same thing, there was a tremendous sense of drama in his performances. Scherchen, as you, you, you obviously know, I don't know whether all our, our, our readers will know, uh, was a, a specialist in contemporary music. He had a great sense of adventure. He performed Schoenberg, Berg, Webern, Stravinsky, Bartok, all sorts of things. But he played the classics as well, uh, was an expert in conducting Haydn. He recorded a lot of the symphonies, all the Beethoven symphonies, some of them more than once. And his performance of the fifth is dynamism. I mean, it is Kleiber prior to Kleiber. And yeah. um, I think this performance here, part of the first movement, is electric. The whole cycle is great, but this is particularly good. I have to say what lis listening to it is, if, if, you know, if the sound didn't slightly give it away, I think you'd be very hard pressed to date it. Um, because it's just got that sort of you almost think he must have he must have known about period instruments because somehow this this performance it doesn't it's not exactly infused by it you sort of sense sense somehow he must have you know he must have as it were somehow magically gone back to basics because as you say it's just got such fire and bite <laughs> Earlier on, you um, you very uh, eloquently characterised the the Carlos Kleiber recording um, of of this work, and I, I couldn't resist popping in um, popping in a little excerpt myself. And this comes from a little bit later in the movement. and And the reason I, I chose it is that I think you know a word that we've used a reasonable amount in this conversation is intensity, which is quite difficult. It's quite difficult to explain, but actually, it's very it's very easy to experience when you're listening to music and and this this passage which leads out of the the oboe solo um shows how quickly i think carlos kleiber can 
as it were, ramp up the intensity. You know, in a matter of bars, all of a sudden it's kind of seething and white hot. And you just think, how do you do that? Well, I think the great thing about Kleiber is that he has an overview of the piece. You feel from the very first bar that he knows exactly where he's going at the very last bar of the symphony, that triumphant closure that I was talking about earlier on. And uh, every passage in the symphony is connected, is sort of dovetailed to the next. There's not uh, a, any element in the performance where you feel he's losing his way. It's a, a fast track, uh, noble. It has, as I said, I was talking about other artists, but it has integrity um, and a sense of structure. And I think in Beethoven 5, because the architecture is so mighty, uh, you don't want to see scaffolding. You want to see just how great the building is. And Kleiber definitely offers that. Do you think, I mean, one thing we've not talked about is is kind of tradition. And, you know, I, I, I don't know whether it, I could prove it. I probably, if I had some time, I probably could sit down and do a lot of counting. But, I mean, the Vienna Philharmonic kind of have this extraordinary relationship with with Beethoven. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, they've played it, you know, virtually since it was composed, they've recorded you know, numerous cycles. And it always strikes me interesting as interesting that when a conductor is engaged to record the Beethoven symphonies by their record company, you know, one of these sort of milestone events, more often than not, they're said, you know, they're obviously asked, would you like to do it with the Vienna Philharmonic? It's almost like sort of, you know, saying to someone, you know, you're going to do this amazing race. Would you like X, you know, this particularly amazing car? I mean, do you think the Vienna Philharmonic brings something to Beethoven that, as it were, sort of meets the conductor halfway? In a sense, it does, although I must say I'm a little bit against the sort of thinking that nails music to nationalities or national orchestras. Uh, with Beethoven, it's such a universal language that, you know, you can look at the New York Philharmonic, the NBC Symphony, the Leningrad Philharmonic, um, the French orchestra that um, uh, Karl Schurich used for his complete recording, uh, of the of the symphonies, the Swedish recording, the, 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 the recordings from Scandinavia, they're all marvellous in their very different ways. So I wouldn't necessarily say, I mean, Berm and the Vienna Philharmonic is great, but, you know, Carrie Ann and the Berlin Phil and the, the recordings that Furtwängler made with the Berlin Phil, I mean, they were... They had something massive to offer in terms of the interpretation. London Symphony with Pierre Monteux, uh, another wonderful cycle, Durati with the London Symphony. So I, I personally don't think, oh, well, Vienna Philharmonic, of course, it's Beethoven and that's the VPO. That's going to be great because actually very often it isn't. It's not as great or greater uh, than other recordings with other orchestras. So it doesn't work for me quite in that way, but that's not to say Bernstein the Vienna Phil, for example, made a marvellous cycle of the symphonies. It's not necess that It doesn't necessarily mean to say that it isn't true that there aren't great recordings of the symphonies with the VPO. Next excerpt, and we've we've moved into the second movement here. Is uh, I mean another, I mean one of the really great orchestras, the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra from Amsterdam, and this is under Maris Janssens. His his he's actually recorded them a, a couple of times. You know he did it later with the Bavarian Radio. But um, it was funny listening to the, this excerpt you chose. You just realised what a what a beautiful sound that orchestra makes. That's why I chose it. Subsidiary voices in the strings. There's a man with imagination who knows how to shape a phrase. And when I was listening for, for our chat, I, I, I just um, got hold of this set of the nine uh, symphonies of Concert Chabal, each one conducted by a different, uh, different conductor. And I thought the fifth was particularly beautiful, the slow movement, uh, the outstanding passage in this performance, because he plays it, he gets the orchestra to play it with real love. <laughs> 
Well, it's interesting you chose the um, the, the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra under, under Maris Janssens for your excerpt from the second movement. And I've 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 stayed in Europe and I've I've gone for a, a fairly recent recording um, by the Budapest Festival Orchestra, conducted by actually a conductor who has a very close relationship with the Royal Concertgebouw as well, Ivan Fischer. And I think what strikes me about his recordings, and I think generally this is something that I always find with Fischer, is that here is a conductor who really knows how to balance an orchestra internally. You know, the voicing when you get, you know, sort of woodwind chorales is exquisitely done. I mean, you feel that Fischer is a conductor who uses his rehearsals as it were, to get the sound absolutely right. Because I, I, I sense with him, he knows what his orchestra can do. And the Budapest Festival Orchestra is one of the truly great orchestras of the world. I mean, just amazing players. And I remember talking to Fisher years ago, and he was saying, you know, whenever he goes and conducts one of the greatest or- great orchestras of the world, there's always somebody from the Budapest Festival Orchestra who's moved there. You know, I think when a great orchestra needs a player, they quite often look to his orchestra to see who they can find. Um, but th- what struck me about his recording of the fifth is it's just, as I say, the internal balance is so exquisitely handled. And in, in this passage, the wind playing is just absolutely glorious. I mean, are you a Fisher fan? I am a Fisher fan. I remember interviewing him not long after his orchestra was formed. And the amazing thing is, if you look back to Hungarian orchestras prior to the Budapest Festival Orchestra, you would not believe the leap in quality that he achieved. Uh, uh, Absolutely amazing. The quality of the playing, the delicacy of it, the dynamism of it. Um, the authenticity of the performances, and I'm not talking about uh, in terms of the scores used, I'm talking about the feeling that you get with the music, not only with Bartok, but as you say here with Beethoven, in Mahler, he's done some absolutely wonderful Mahler recordings, and Fisher is somebody with a brain. You know, he has an idea of how music, or how a work should sound, and also the shape of it. And I think the the finest aspect of this performance is the way the music, a bit like Maris Janssen's with the Concertgebouw, is the way he moulds individual passages. And um, that makes you listen again. Always the great thing about listening to a new recording or a recording that's new to you of a favourite symphony is does it make you hear the music again? And I think in the case of Fisher, it does. Well, let's stay with um, Hungarian conductors. Your your next choice is Antal Dorati. Actually, interestingly, Antal Dorati, I think, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, conducted the first live performance of Beethoven V I ever heard with the, the Royal Philharmonic. Same as me, um, would you believe? Exactly the same, the RPO <laughs> and Dorati. And the first ninth as well. Uh, at the Albert Hall, I remember. I didn't. I didn't hear the the fifth live until quite a few years after I'd I'd learned it from a record. And I suspect my Durati performance was many many years after after yours. And in a way, he was quite a different conductor, sort of when I encountered him. Because you know, if we wind the clock back to sort of late fifties, early sixties, I mean, he was a real firebrand. Yeah, he was. And of course, you had the Mercury recording uh, team on uh, on hand to make the LSO which this recording is with right bring it right up front the, the you know the sections were in your face the bite of the strings uh, the presence the the the, uh, the famous living presence recording technique the realism of the sound it was like you were on the conductor's rostrum conducting the performance yourself but i think the performance of the scherzo especially the fugato middle section of it is one of the most thrilling that I've ever heard. In fact, the whole performance, when I did a, 
um, not the usual suspects article for you on uh, on Beethoven. I think it was 20 artists who you wouldn't normally associate with uh, Beethoven works. His version of the fifth, this one we're going to hear an extract from, was the one I chose. And uh, it is nearest, well, after Carlos Kleiber, I suppose, it's one of the few that gets near my ideal in as much as it's unfussy, it's direct, it's strong, there's clear thinking from the rostrum there, the playing is terrific, and uh, as for incisive playing, you won't get much that's in more incisive than this. <laughs> That was Antal Dorati in, in, in the LSO. And it's interesting. I mean, this this recording, I mean, it, it is, I agree, it's absolutely, it sizzles. But do you think one can, one can one follow the sort of changing trends in performance? If you, you know, if you took a, if you took a recording from every decade from, I don't know, sort of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, so on. I mean, do you think... Does the, the way people approach music, does that change? And I mean, I'm not talking about period instruments, but do you think there's a sort of evolution in t interpretation? You know, different generations go for different things. Yes, I think that's true. And I think the big divide was before and after the Second World War. Before the Second World War, there was a sort of romantic idealism that uh, brought itself, that was brought into interpretation quite romantic, yes, dynamic and exciting too with Toscanini and people like that. After the war, idealism became almost a dirty word because of the terrible things that had been witnessed that had happened during the war. And I think interpreters went for a much more objective, abstract approach to music. So, say, Carrie Anne and the Philharmonia doing the Beethoven symphonies, um, you know, to give just one example, the whole... I don't know, the whole world had changed. And I think that was reflected in the way music was played. Klempera, for example, another good example. Austere, marmorial, with woodwinds well to the fore. You know, if, if you didn't like it, it was too bad. That was the way he was going to do it. Um, no excess of feeling, no lack of feeling, but it was basically about architecture. And that was the difference between post-war and pre-war music making the same with piano playing and violin playing you know the sense of reverie romance passion imagination all that changed i'm not saying it disappeared completely but i think people's sights had altered after the war they'd been shocked into listening to and playing music in a different way so I think, you know, when you hear modern performances, I mean, people are getting back to it. They're allowing him a bit more imagination into their interpretations now. It was terribly... Um, well, it was very straightforward after the war. Those uh, The magic, I'm not going to say it had gone because obviously some of the pre-war musicians were still there. Uh, but um, Stokowski, for example, had dropped his portamenti, you know, Melberg and Stokowski before the war, there were, you know, there were portamenti, um, which were very, very marked. I love them. I think if they're played with conviction, but it's no good applying them just because you feel you ought to uh, apply them um, uh, historically. They've got to be played from the heart. And certainly that Stokowski Chike 5 I spoke about had it. But I think that was the biggest leap. After that, yes, decades, the first decade of the period instruments. I remember interviewing Nicholas Arnoncourt um, the first time I interviewed him and we were talking about Bach interpretation. And he said, you know, people think that I'm, I'm trying to um, revisit what Bach heard when he played or he heard performances of his Sir Matthew Passion or the Cantatas or whatever, he said, that's not the reason I use period instruments. The reason I use period instruments is because the music sounds better. And that is the only real reason to use period instruments. 
uh, in not because it's more authentic, because who knows what authentic means? Who knows how Beethoven would have wanted his Fifth Symphony to sound? Nobody knows. Uh, but, you know, it's it's sort of interesting to hear them play. There are some. I mean, I like the Franz Bruchen cycles of Beethoven's symphonies. What, yeah, about, what, what about you? No, I mean, I, I, I love the, the Bruchen. I mean, I remember, I think, probably the, mo the period in instrument performance of a Beethoven symphony that made the most impact on me, because I just sort of thought, well, actually, yes, it's a combination of a new sound world, but actually it's the Beethoven I know. And that was the, the recording of the Eroica that, that came out on Philips, and he obviously subsequently recorded it. But I think it's interesting with the whole period instrument movement is that, yes, in the early years, that was that sort of, you, you felt it was being led by the you know, people were being led by the head and the intellect and actually the heart was somewhat missing. And then it sort of caught up. And now I think it, we've passed, as it were, passed through that. And now the period instrument um, approach is infusing traditional performances. But um, I've actually chosen, and it's actually the only period instrument um, performance we've, we've chosen in this little micro survey. And this is, this is from John Elliott Gardner's um, first cycle of, well, first recording of Beethoven V, which he made um, for Arkiv. And uh, it's, a, it's a similar passage to the one you've chosen from Durati. And, I, and what strikes me is, I mean, not, not only is that wonderful sense of, you, you really feel the kind of the fibre and texture of the bass line in this, but there's a beautiful rhythm that sort of springs out of it, almost sort of in spite of itself. And you just feel that sort of this music is, it's, it's digging away, but it's actually dancing at the same time. And I'd, I'd not heard this performance for many years, and I, I really, really love Loved it. admire it but i i do find it a little bit muddled and a, a little bit too fast i i i'm given a choice between that and, uh, yeah between that and the durati i think i'd i'd still stick with the durati because that grit and fiber that you you talk about i find more present in the durati than in uh, the john elliott gardner now, of course, I mean, one of the, the most extraordinary moments in Beethoven V, and probably one of the most extraordinary movements in all classical music, is that, is that transition from the third movement to the finale, when the music sort of, it, it shuts down, and you get this incredible sense of anticipation, and you just know something astounding is going to happen, and of course it does when the finale comes in, and you've You've opted for a group recording literally from this moment of this explosion into the finale from uh, Charles Munch and the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Well, the great thing about Munch is he had um, uh, experience in Europe playing the playing the violin. Um, you don't normally associate him with broad performances, uh, but... His Beethoven Fifth, I think, is absolutely terrific. And the beginning of the finale is very similar to Toscanini's first uh, commercial recording of the Fifth, which was with the NBC Symphony in 1939. It's extremely broad. And um, the majesty that comes across, I think, is, is, is remarkable. The whole performance really hangs together. And I think the, the reason I've chosen it, it is, it, you know, people associate uh, Beethoven recordings, Beethoven symphony recordings of this era, 1950s and 60s, with um, very fast, very flash interpretations. Munch isn't like that at all. He, he makes the orchestra, obviously the, the Boston Symphony has a sort of European core when it comes to its sound, specifically French. He makes the symphony sound extremely um, very European. And this opening of the finale has a real gravitas to it. I, every time I hear it, I think, my goodness, this, is, this man Munch could certainly push the boat out in directions you weren't expecting him to. There's, a, there's incredible um, density, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I absolutely don't mean it's heavy, but there's a sort of a, a, a richness and a depth to the sound that is really quite extraordinary. And I, I think that's partly why this finale, opening of this finale, makes such impact, because at this tempo, 
it just every note as it were sort of feels full you know you don't feel I, I don't know I just I, I I'd never heard this performance before you 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 suggested it and I have to say I was bowled over and I think this is one of the most miraculous passages in the whole performance oh, absolutely Now, for my last choice, um, I've gone for a recording that was really something of a milestone in, in interpretation and recordings of Beethoven's symphonies. And this is the, the carry-on cycle from the very early 60s, 1962. First time the p symphonies had ever been sort of conceived as a cycle, boxed as a cycle, marketed as a cycle, a sort of, you know, all in one go. And, I mean, Carrion is an interesting conductor because there are so many Carrions. You know, Carrion in front of the Philharmonia, if you listen to his cycle with the Philharmonia, it sounds completely different to when he recorded it, you know, some years later with the Berlin Phil, and, of course, he went on and then subsequently recorded a few more times. But this, this 1962 performance, um, I'd not heard it for many years, and I must say I, I was quite surprised at the sort of the ferocity and the drive of it, because, you know, so often when one thinks of Carrion, you know, one thinks of, you know, slightly blunted edges, you know, a beautiful sheen to the performance. And actually, you, there's almost a whiff of Toscanini at times about about this performance. And, and particularly, um, I've chosen a, a passage in the um, in the last movement, which I think characterises the sort of, I don't know, the, the sort of glint of this recording. I mean, is it is it a, is it a performance that appeals to you? Well, it's interesting because it, it was one of the first stereo recordings of the symphony that, uh, in fact, I had a friend who had it, uh, the individual disc, as you, as you recall, it was two sides of an LP, so it wasn't exactly a generous LP. And I used to listen to it, and there were things about it I loved. Um, the sound was wonderful. It had this uh, chromium edge to it. Some aspects to it, like the legato um, on the brass, didn't have quite the attack. And I'm not going to say it wasn't powerful, because the sound, as with everything with Carrie Ann, when it's uh, when he's when everything is playing full out, is always powerful. Um, maybe a little on the smooth and sleek side, uh, but you know, I played it a lot. I thought it was it was a, a, a brilliant performance. And I have got it. I've got the whole cycle still in my collection. So I suppose that says a lot. And I I would say that of all the Beethoven cycles that um, Carrion did, this is the one that I like the most because it's the most consistent. As you, And as you rightly point out, it was conceived as a cycle and it sounds as if it was conceived as a cycle. And there's something to be said for that. So I'd say, no, I'm not going to say it's my favourite Beethoven five because it, it, it isn't. And I prefer the Carlos Kleiber. But um, there's no doubt in my mind that it is one of the most uh, distinguished of its era and uh, certainly uh, stands the test of time. end our little chat about uh, Beethoven symphonies we've, we've set ourselves the task of of, of recommending a, a, a modern recording and the thinking behind this is that if if you hear this recording and you suddenly think wow I want to hear these people you can I mean I always think that's sort of one of the sort of slightly slightly sort of downsides of being a sort of record, passionate record collector is that you know if you play a recording to somebody and they're completely enthused and they go oh my god I have to go and hear these people and you're thinking well I'm terribly sorry but actually the conductor's been dead for you know 45 years and probably most of the orchestra have retired if they're not dead too so we're going for a recording that in theory you could if the provided the concert halls were open you could go and hear these people um uh play this very music. And interestingly, we, we started off with the Vienna Philharmonic and Carlos Kleiber. And in a way, we, we have a Vienna connection here because the recording we, we're both going to sort of uh, put our weight behind is the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra conducted by Manfred Honig, who, of course, was a second violinist 
in the Vienna Philharmonic. So he's sort of part of that tradition. But in a way, he's moved that tradition on. I mean, I thought this was a, an absolutely wonderful recording and so much to talk about. And we probably won't have time to talk about too much. But I just found the, rather like the, the Fisher recording, the inner detail is absolutely glorious throughout this. And he also divides his strings, which in my book always, you know, earns, you know, earns a few brownie points. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, when you listen to Beethoven and you listen to those divided strings shooting across antiphonally uh, the orchestra, you realise that the reason that Beethoven divided them was musical, not for any other reason at all. And and uh, his performance, which I agree with you, is remarkable. And it's individual. Uh, another case of the opening four notes, that those hammer blows at the beginning being set at a slower tempo. I think Richard uh, mentioned that in, in his review when he reviewed it for Gramophone. Uh, to the rest of the uh, movement, uh, the Allegro flies off at a terrific lick once that those hammer blows have gone as if they've they've uh, goaded the rest of the orchestra, rest of the strings into action. The dynamism, the recording is absolutely fabulous. And he is a master of the orchestra. And I think it takes an insider, which he was somebody who sat within the ranks of the orchestra, to know what needs to be heard. And, uh, of course, he's a, a very good example of somebody who knows the music and the orchestra from the inside, which is one of the reasons he's such a wonderful conductor. I think he's the best treading the boards at the moment, Manfred Honig. I think he's wonderful. He's made some great records with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. You know, another version that we could have mentioned, oh, oh, how many versions could we have mentioned, um, is DG brought out uh, William Steinberg's second cycle of the Beethoven symphonies with the Pittsburgh symphony. And that's also very good. In fact, I listened to that last night and it's it's good. But could I honestly say it's more impressive than Honig? No, it isn't. I mean, obviously the sound isn't as good, but it's very, very good, uh, very honest, very straightforward along the Girati lines. But Honig um, has fire in his uh, in his blood, you know, it's... And the orchid. Oh, the and the orchestra sounds he, so good. It, he's he's really trained that orchestra to NBC levels or Berlin Philharmonic, whatever you want to say. So I reckon that um, if this is the beginning of a new cycle, well, yeah, it's got seven on it as well, hasn't it? A bit like the, the current um, reissue of the Kleiber. So, yeah, and I think nine has just come out. It has. Yeah, so yeah. look so forward I, to that. I look forward to that. I haven't heard it yet. So... Yeah, I think it's a, a pretty good... I can't... Look, people might question this or that detail, but that doesn't matter. Nobody's going to question the impact of the performance or the sincerity and integrity of Honig's interpretation. <laughs> 